Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the really long title that's around blockchain and healthcare. Uh, <laughs> my name is Jim St. Clair. I'm the executive director for Linux Foundation Public Health, and I'm very pleased to have four of my friends here today to talk about both healthcare as an industry and life sciences, as well as implications for blockchain, and I think just get into some of the details. Um, a great question, perhaps, to pose to everyone. Is there anyone here that comes from a healthcare background or associated with healthcare or life sciences in your business practice? Great, fantastic. One, two, three. Yeah, that's great. The number's building. Four, got a good one. Yeah, outstanding. Good, good. Five. I said five snuck in there. Do I get six? I want six. Everybody got six on the floor. I have an option going <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be a good time, absolutely. Well, great. Well, so this is intended to be informative as much about the wild and wacky world of healthcare and life sciences, which are commonly associated with one another, but really constitute huge industries on their own. And then, of course, those aspects of blockchain from an architecture, from a decentralization, from a business standpoint. With that, I'm going to turn it over <clears throat> excuse me, to my panelists and allow Florida to introduce herself and pass the mic down and, and talk to everybody. Okay, thank you, Jim. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all. My name is Flora Nanda. I am from Pfizer. <coughs> I am the technology and process lead for Pfizer. And one of the main focus technology areas is uh, blockchain. So we have like different projects. We are part of uh, different consortium, which are our external initiatives. And we have in internal initiatives as well. So uh, before Pfizer, I am in this corporate industry for quite a while. I come from semiconductor, hardware manufacturing, software licensing, and as well an academician. So I have a long career. So when it comes to blockchain, I kind of understand the pain point cross industry as well, though I'm from healthcare or life sciences right now. Hi, I'm Sofia Lopez. I'm one of the founders of Kaleido, a Web3 infrastructure company. We've been uh, very focused on helping enterprises uh, adopt Web3 technology over the last five years. Prior, and we run thousands of chains across industry, um, So, but healthcare has a special place in my heart um, just because it touches all of our lives. And then also I had the privilege to work in that space. Um, I was at IBM for 10 years. I'm an engineer by training, but I actually worked for two and a half years um, just you know, with clients trying to bring, um, bring technology to help solve their problems. I worked primarily with providers in that role, but um, the, a lot of interesting things going on even, even back then in the healthcare space. So happy to uh, talk about what we're seeing in Web3 and, and healthcare. Thanks. We have a great mix of uh, perspectives here. Mm -hmm. My name is Alan Bachman. I'm an identity practitioner and research architect. Over the last five years, I've explored supply chains, B2B, and identity. And my views today will be uh, my own and not reflective of my employer. Hello, uh, my name is Charles Okochu. I work for a small bookstore <clears throat> uh, called AWS, Amazon. And <clears throat> I've been with Amazon now for about uh, three years. I run uh, global business development for our Amazon managed blockchain service and also quantum ledger database. So we, you know, we're seeing a lot of innovation in the space, especially in healthcare, um, in digital transformations taking place across the industry. Uh, and a lot of them are looking to adopt uh, blockchain services. And, you know, so I'll be happy to talk to you guys about some use cases that we're seeing uh, being adopted. <clears throat> Great. Well, and Charles, since you, you, you're the last one over the mic, I'll, I'll kick off with you for questions. Sure. As we mentioned, before we even get into the blockchain aspects of it, just provide briefly to the audience your perspective on some of the challenges that you see healthcare industry, life sciences is wise, and then, of course, share with everyone else. Sure. So I think you know, initially, you know, when blockchain started becoming you know, uh, adopted, you know, a lot of the challenges that we saw uh, are focused on creating consortiums and, you know, uh, for, to allow different healthcare you know, uh, providers to share information. And uh, so there, there have been some uh, challenges as far as, you know, getting different uh, organizations to work together. And, and, and that's kind of where we saw a lot of resistance. Uh, but over time, we're seeing more adoption, not in, for a hybrid model where some data or some information is stored on private chains and then uh, using public chains for uh, more you know, information that can be anonymized or allowing for a faster adoption for, from a customer perspective. 
So in decentralized identity is one area where that's we're seeing a lot of interest to allow you know patients to store their data and also have control over the data and you know and share the data and give access to to your patient data across uh, public chain. So that's we're seeing a lot of increased usage and increased adoption in that space. I think an area you know that's a simple uh, but in it, a consideration that should be emphasized mm -hmm. when you're starting out just so that you don't get stuck <laughs> is focusing on alignment. So the first part of alignment is getting people together to talk about this is what the technology can do, what it should do, uh, what's the hype around it, what's, you know, get past the terminology. And then the second part is look at what the group needs. You know, identify the basic common uh, shared services that you need. Focus on creating those basic shared common uh, services that you need and then promoting apps that are built in those consortiums to use those, you know, shared common services. And uh, hopefully that sticks <laughs> with everyone because as you elevate your app or, you know, go forward, you want people to have <clears throat> trust. So anything that's built in a DevSecOps or repeatable manner that's been scanned and has had transparency, you know, will accelerate uh, software development and confidence. Uh, I was thinking, uh, one thing I wanted to start with is just looking, at least from the shoes of the, um, the folks in the trenches. So, you know, over the last decade, if you were talking to a CIO at a lot of um, healthcare providers who got hit with meaningful use, Accountable mm -hmm. Care Act, moving to value-based outcomes, get, you know, issues like you can't have the same person with a chronic care condition come back into the ER within 30 days or you won't get paid. So, you know, 30-day readmit, issues around data blocking. So over the last decade in the healthcare space, there has been, you know, drive to digitally transform, um, obviously moving to the cloud as part of that, working together as more of an ecosystem because you have population health, you have coordinated care. So you can't have all the data in all the silos like traditionally has been in the industry. Um, so I think, you know, when I first start working in the space, some a lot of CIOs started thinking, this is a good time to retire <laughs> because we've got these regulations, we've got, um, you know, fees and penalties if we don't comply. So how can technology help us? And, and you see often in a lot of these organizations, you know, they were buying packaged apps and didn't really have the skills to, to deal with some of these new challenges. So I think, you know, that applies to now looking at Web3, blockchain, digital assets, you know, how do you get the skills internally to do this? You know, uh, try to avoid focusing on the real problems of bringing multiple parties together and, and solving issues. Like what can we do that's a common shared service working together versus everyone trying to reinvent the wheel, but trying to stay a couple layers above just, you know, the technology itself. And, and how could they move quickly and show real business value? Yeah, uh, I agree with all of them, uh, but yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, would, I would tackle this question in a different, little different way mm -hmm. over the years with working with different business use cases and blockchain technology. Uh, we categorized all the problem areas into three groups uh, from the life sciences perspective. One is from the health data, uh, second one is clinical trial, and third one is supply chain. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to health data, it sounds easier than done. It's very complex, all the way from collecting the data, storing the data, processing the data, and who owns the data, right? We just, uh, I was listening to this Cali Health DAO and everything, so true the problem is. So that is one challenge challenging area, we can use blockchain to solve some of it, but we need blessing from the ecosystem partners and all of it. The second category is clinical trial, starting from the discovery phase all the way to marketing, post-marketing survey, real world evidence, everywhere I see where the technology can fit. There are challenges, but there are opportunities as well using this technology. And supply chain, everyone knows about supply chain. It's uh, multiple parties. It's the, the goods transferred through multiple hands. It's a low hanging fruit. Uh, but technology adoption wise, there are many challenges. I will not talk about this one, like multi-party bringing everyone on board and uh, adoption of the technology. There are many technology providers, but who is buying it, right? Who is consuming those ones? Those are the main areas we have to look at. So that, that, that is my perspective. 
Great. And Flora, if I could pick up from there, since Sophia opened the door on digital transformation, kind of everyone's thoughts on where are your organization's a digital transformation journey and what are these things to consider? So. Okay, that, that's an interesting question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so everyone is talking about digitization and digitalization. So I got to understand recently that there are two different concepts. Digitization is the automation, digitalization and changing the mindset as well as the automation. Um, and so from, uh, from the digital transformation perspective, yes, the mindset is there. The culture is gradually changing. The leaders and the uh, management team are trying to put together teams that think in the digital transformation way. I would talk specifically about blockchain. So there are many technologies out there. I would compare blockchain with cloud, AI, ML, and all those technologies. Uh, cloud and AI, ML got their adoption, but blockchain from the enterprise perspective, struggling a little bit. Um, now that is because like it's a multi-party business, it's not a single party. I cannot simply say that Pfizer has a blockchain network running its own node. That doesn't make sense. So we are not... Our, not yet there, uh, but what what we are planning to do here is like we can go towards public blockchain and try to think of some use cases that we can go alone so that that would be a faster route to adoption. But digital transformation is pursuing agile methodology, product management, all these things are coming to uh, enterprises. So yes, we are out there maybe in next two, three years. Uh, all organization would be digital transparent. I must tell the thing, things like I always closely observe the market, the workforce that market is looking for. Right now I get uh, requirements like uh, uh, digitalization of sales organization, mm -hmm. digitalization mm -hmm. of uh, quality organization, digitalization of marketing organization. So it's good to see, and these are very business focused with digital strategies. So our organization is also out there. Um, one comment I was reflecting when you were speaking is, you know, if you just look at digital transformation and organizational change, there's a well-known change management specialist, John Cotter, who said 70% of organizational change initiatives fail. So a lot of times people will look at the technology, but it's, it's not the technology, it's the people and the processes. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, here's a number of principles that help make, you know, what are our principles that might guarantee a better chance of success? And one, the first one is you need a burning platform. <laughs> so people need to be a jump from where they are because their feet are on fire. So we, we did see that with COVID. So, you know, we, uh, Kaleido runs uh, networks across industries and, you know, in the insurance space, which is probably just as mired in compliance and regulation and legacy systems as healthcare, they told us that their digital transformation roadmaps accelerated by a decade. And, and we saw that, they, and they were doing really interesting projects. Um, there's actually one consortium that's over 100 years old. They have 24 different projects going on, industry working groups with the, across life and annuities, property and casualty, reinsurance, um, doing things like creating a master death record in the US. We did, you know, when COVID was happening, there was no way, you know, people, you're asking the, the widow whose seven-year-old husband passed away to take a paper copy of the death certificate to the bank to the funeral home and get like 15 copies of these in the middle of a pandemic. So, I mean, that's pretty crazy. So Nationwide Prudential and others said, we need to come together to get, solve the shared data problem across the industry. And that's what blockchain is really good for. You know, digital assets now layer on incentives with tokens. So there's a healthcare network that many of you are familiar with uh, called Synaptic that we work with. And they use tokenized incentives really as a data monetization uh, play that if you contribute data or you update data, you get paid. You avoid the tragedy of the commons. Other people who are not participating, not contributing, they'll have to pay to subscribe to that data. And in other cases, we see instead of the fungible tokens, the non fungibles, so documents like powers of attorney, you know, as you're digitizing, I didn't actually know the difference between those two. So I, I love when I learn something new. So digitizing these very paper-based manual processes, you know, now you can represent something with global identity with these token standards. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a group of 200 insurers we're working with around the surety bonds and they're 
power of attorney represented with NFTs or things like credentialing in the space as well. So it's a lot of interesting developments, but a lot of it's trying to put the easy button onto technology and letting people focus on some of the organizational, business, legal issues of getting multiple parties in an ecosystem to work together. And I guess in mu multiple people mentioned, I think enterprise blockchain started thinking about solving the frenemies, as Alan said, mm -hmm. in our prep mm -hmm. problem, competition, you know, this shared problem. But um, we're also seeing a lot of enterprise saying, hey, I'm going to participate in a dozen or more use cases. So I need a Web3 gateway. I might run a node in one network. I might launch my own solution. And it's really more of just a decentralized app that people can access, it might be B2C, could be B2B. So how can I do that at scale? And that's an interesting next evolution we're getting to when people are planning you know, multiple types of participation across Web3 projects. So I'm gonna just talk about from like just a generalized perspective. And when I look back at you know, open source projects and how they you know, progress, the, the thing that sticks to me is the accountability. You know, how do we add accountability to make these systems that we say are trustworthy, actually trustworthy? <laughs> uh, just because it's on a blockchain doesn't mean it's, you know, awesome. Um, and I look at, you know, existing industries, you know, they do know your customer, they do the proofing, they do account resolution. And if you can not only verify that the transaction on your blockchain is um, high confidence, maybe not perfect. Um, and you can also identify that the people behind it are real, they're not bots or uh, some type of duplicate account. Um, some pretty big things can happen. <laughs> uh, and, and you can get to some of those, you know, root issues that um, we were looking for. The big thing that I see when you have um, accountability is the overall trust that you don't have to tell people. Right, they they get it. They they can see, uh, you know, what you're trying to do. So um, at AWS, we we work with a lot of customers who are going through their digital transformation. Um, as uh, she mentioned earlier, you know, during COVID, we saw like a you know giant increase in customers wanting to adopt blockchain for you know COVID uh, vaccine tracking, you know, for certifications and lots about two or three projects. And uh, we also see for, you know, supply chain, like as uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, we, but not just tracking the uh, those location and, but also tracking the chain, you know, tracking the condition. For instance, COVID vaccines require, you know, cold storage. So, you know, we see all, we saw a lot of implementations of, you know, using temperature sensors, IOT devices, to track and, and storing all of that information on, on the blockchain. So th that's actually led to a lot of other conversations that we're having with traditional, you know, healthcare, life sciences mm -hmm. companies for in things like patient consent tracking mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and other other use cases. Another very interesting use case that you mentioned uh, was for incentivizing patients uh, or, or health, you know, f to share their healthcare records for you know, or ensuring that they're leveraging or taking taking their uh, doctor's advice, you know, taking their medicines and offering them uh, tokens uh, so they can be paid. So there are a lot of very interesting use cases that we're seeing. Uh, and it's definitely, you know, as in the healthcare industry, we get a lot of, you know, customers asking what their competitors or their peers are doing. And, you know, they want to, you know, do a POC or some sort of uh, pilot to see if they can leverage it. So that's driving a lot of adoption of, of, of the service across the industry. And Charles, I'll just pull on that thread for a minute. From your perspective, AWS, we've heard quite a bit so far about things like governance and accountability and building consortiums. What do you see for consortiums and consortium governance coming along with customers as a bedrock to their, to their blockchain exploration efforts? Yeah, I think, you know, generally what we've seen is we, when we ask customers, you know, especially customers reach out to us and say, hey, we're interested in doing a blockchain project. I mean, one of the first things we ask is, what, which, which partners are you interested in working with? Are you, or what partners are you expecting to join the consortium? And one very easy indicator of whether a project is going to be successful is if you can identify one or two partners that are willing to join you in that POC. If you're not, if you can't find somebody, you're just going to build it and hope they come. 
most likely it's not going to go anywhere. And, and we've also seen that sometimes it's best to look at the market leaders or, you know, companies like Pfizer, you know, who, are, who have already a, a lot of market presence. Um, and there are lots of projects in that space regarding things like, you know, settling uh, pharmaceutical claims and, you know, uh, PBRs, which is uh, pharmacy mm -hmm. benefit management. Mm -hmm. And so working with those large, those organizations were able to actually, you know, build, you know, more successful consortiums, you know, going forward. Mm. Yeah. And Alan, your thoughts on it? Uh, I'm actually going to get a pass on this one. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, know, he knows uh, too a, much. He's just not a, he's a T, <laughs> not a T player. He can't do a consortium. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, it's interesting. There are, there are a lot of different models. Um, and one thing I didn't mention actually in the intro, um, so I was at IBM and launched the IBM blockchain platform. Actually, Sham, who's here, we worked in the early days with lots yeah, of different yeah. models. I think you had a slide of a lot of these, I remember, <laughs> as we were observing the patterns. So, um, I mean, there could be an existing consortium. So we see that in some industries, like I mentioned, insurance in the U.S., there's one that's over 100 years old. So they naturally have these sort of working groups and membership and then they're looking at how can they sort of operationalize going from, you know, a lab and identifying use case project and then graduating the projects up. Um, but you can see companies who form a new co or basically a joint venture. So to Charles' point, people don't like joining their competitors thing. <laughs> they want to be equals around a table. So we, we've seen some models of that, especially in like the first generation of enterprise projects. And the cautions there are, even if you're well funded by deep pockets who are each of the members, you're basically a startup. And then the people who are on that in the new co need to think and act like a startup. You need to be very focused on product market fit. There was, you know, great discussion by one of those consortiums in the member summit talking about what they learned. And, you know, you need to listen to what the market needs and is a problem you're sol solving urgent, pervasive, and people are willing to pay for it because you can't, had this sort of corporate mindset, like there's going to be some CFO who just keeps funding you, and you need to, you know, you need to, you know, you need to be able to deliver value and um, not spend like five years reinventing all the plumbing layers and never get to providing value. Um, so, so those are some different models. And then there are people who, you know, have the industry relationships. A lot of this are existing business relationships that now you're digitally transforming. There could be things you couldn't do before that you could do now. So we have some industries who say, we've been trying to solve this for 10 years, and now we finally, the technology's here, and we can do this. Um, so there could be situations where there is an industry solution provider, and people are subscribing to that service. Um, but, you know, there's better, faster, cheaper. They're evolving the way they're working, or more like an evolution, or there could be a revolution just using some of the new Web3 constructs. Mm -hmm. We do see in some of these um, networks, instead of forming a new co and a legal entity that sort of makes decisions, they stay completely decentralized. So they're just an alliance and it really has tokens. It's almost like an enterprise mm -hmm. DAO that they're trying to align incentives that way. Mm -hmm. so, so lots of different approaches and you sort of have to think about what makes the most sense for what you're trying to accomplish, but keeping an eye on What's the product, the product market fit, you know, what's the value you're driving should be what you start with. And then, you know, the technology. There's a lot of projects we're involved with where people don't even know blockchain is delivering the, like, better, you know, product or efficiency. And they're getting a lot more traction. And you don't need to say, hey, there's blockchain inside. Because it should get to that across many of these use cases where people are using it because it makes sense or it drives some additional benefit, but not because of the technology inside. And I think that's where, you know, AI that started 30 plus years ago has gotten to, you know, it's woven into the tapestry of a lot of uh, offerings today, but it took a while to get there. And I think blockchain is actually moving in Web3 much faster than that. So that's the good news. But there's a lot of learnings along the way, which is why it's great to be um, discussing this with a lot of the industry leaders. Okay, uh, I forgot the question. Maybe it was around consortium <laughs> and uh, <laughs> governance. You could take this any angle you want. That's exactly right. 
Uh, okay, the first thing for us, like I will talk strictly from a corporate perspective because we are not selling service, we are consumers of the service, right? Uh, so it's interesting that you mentioned uh, that we don't have to worry about funding. Oh yeah, we have to worry about <laughs> funding. So for the first thing we need to do before even jumping into any uh, decision, uh, we have to get business buy-in because business is the one who funds all the projects, even with the digital innovation. The the operating model has not been changed, though the mindset is changing the operating model. To change the operating model, it will take a while. So first thing is we get the business buy-in. Once the business is ready, then we think about the consortium building. Uh, so there are different models we follow. For example, we can partner with the external consortium with our, all our peers and all our um, actors, like maybe for pharma industry, it would be wholesalers or the dispensers like Walmart. Uh, Walgreens in the US. I'm sorry, we are in Ireland. I'm not familiar with the pharmacy system. Uh, but that is one thing. For example, we are in part of Pharma Ledger, where although there are 17 uh, pharmaceutical industries, we are part of that group as well. There is another model that we follow that is kind of startup led model that is a chronicled and mid ledger model. Mm -hmm. So that uh, startup will get funding uh, from the venture capitals and then the startup's responsibility is to build a consortium. Then the startup invites us to join the consortium but remember we have to get business buy-in to join that one because we have to finance our participation as well. So that is another model. The third kind of model, which is an interesting model, like we start internally, then we build a POC in a small scale, then the, we invite our peers to join the network in the POC, then pilot, then, 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 and then, right, then scale it. Uh, in all these models, the governance is very important. Uh, we actually, if we do not have a proper governance, the first question we get from our peers or the partners, uh, who has a right to decide who joins your network, right? This is a permission network for the enterprises. So then who deploys the code? Who decides the code change management, like DevSecOps? So if we work on the governance from the get-go in parallel, so by the time we reach the end of the POC and we are ready to jump in the pilot, we have the governance model, but it is very crucial for the enterprise models. The last model, which is my favorite model, which I always uh, advocate for, forget about all the enterprise blockchains, forget about all the permission blockchains and everything. You said Web3 is ad advancing. Why can't we deploy our uh, use cases using public mm -hmm. blockchain? We are talking about some regulatory aspects of it, but it totally depends mm -hmm. on what data actually you are putting on the public blockchain. Why can't we build our own use case using public blockchain? Uh, so I am an advocate for that one, but as I mentioned, we are we have to get business buy-in. We are not yet there, but we are pushing for some public blockchain use cases. Um, interesting enough that there is a decentralized autonomous organization, DAOs, in clinical resource space. They call it decentralized science. I think we were talking yeah, about yeah. that. Mm -hmm. uh, so Pfizer has expressed interest to invest in Vita DAO. It's a public news. That's why I am at the liberty of um, discussing it with the audience. Uh, so. That mindset is there, it's from Pfizer Ventures, which is a very good thing. So that is the first uh, step in the right direction. So that is where we stand from the consortium perspective. Excellent, excellent, good feedback. And I think we have about five minutes left on our schedule. So I wanna give the audience a chance. I'm sure there are some questions brewing uh, that I can, I don't know if there's a mic out there. If there's not, I'll be happy to bring it over to you for any questions or anything you wanna bring up. Okay. No questions? Oh, there we go. One right there, yeah. <clears throat> all right, hi, I'm John Goldschmidt. I think we've all met, but um, I'm with Polygon, so I, I like the sound of the public blockchain stuff. Uh, but I'm curious about the DAO concept. What, are the, what would be the kind of um, operations of the DAO? What is the DAO trying to achieve? I think DAOs are a great use case also for enterprises, but just curious what you're, you know, how it's working with Pfizer. I am going to bring the mic back to you so you get the recording. So, yeah. 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 
Okay, so <coughs> this is this is Pfizer's interest to invest in the Dow as a venture capitalist. I mentioned it's a Pfizer Ventures interest. So we are investing in this company, not like we are uh, participating in the day-to-day -day operations or buying their token. I think their token is called Vita token. We are not buying their token. So we have a considerable amount we are investing there, but our interest is in clinical resource space, which is the decentralized uh, science concept. The concept of this clinical research is like we, we will fund the projects that will not get funding otherwise. There are many research initiatives, but they die soon because they don't get the funding. Uh, the intent of this clinical research or the DAOs in clinical research and decentralized science in general is to provide them funding. I think VitaDAO is working on some product in the longevity area, and we are interested in that one. But if you follow the VitaDAO's paper, the white paper, they, the use case is very interesting. It is not about the token you buy to get the voting rights, because DAO is all about voting rights and everything. It's not only the token you buy, but it's the intellectual property as well. There is an NFT angle to it. The intellectual property getting generated with this research would be deployed as an NFT, and you can monetize it in the marketplace, selling it or leasing it. So that is another interesting angle. So we are interested in the whole concept. So we are invest we expressed interest in investing in this organization. Make sense? Okay. Thanks for the question. Yes, great question. Time for one more. <clears throat> and no more questions. And if we have no <clears throat> excuse me, if we have no more questions, I'd like you to thank my outstanding panel and appreciate your participation today. <clears throat>